Hi everyone, welcome to the sixth episode of the Making Sense with Ed Bitowski podcast. Today we'll be discussing why the stock market moves the way it does and things that you can be looking for to help educate yourself in your own investment process. So uh, a coach of mine used to tell me that learning the game and, and learning the rules of the game, more importantly, was half the battle in terms of being successful in whatever endeavor that you were undertaking. And really the, the same goes with investing or, or following the stock markets. Um, oftentimes we get very emotional in terms of what we look for in terms of investments, uh, when just in fact we should be the opposite. So today we'll be discussing some themes that you might see throughout uh, following the stock market, things that you might look for during your experience. Um, Ed will be building off of his 35 year experience following the market. So some things he's seen throughout uh, those decades. Of course, if you ever have any questions um, about the show that you'd want to have uh, included in the next episode, we'd be happy to take those. You can email info at Chapwood Investments. But uh, without too much further ado, let's get to the show. And thanks again for visiting. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number six of the Making Sense podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the stock market and how it moves. I know this is a common fascination with a lot of people, um, you know, how the, the market moves, what brings it up, what brings it down. Um, Ed, what uh, give us a high level definition of the stock market and take me through anything that that would be relevant in this category. Well, sure. It's, it's really amazing how many stocks trade publicly. And that means that they go to not just the New York Stock Exchange, or the over the counter market, but stocks that trade all over the world. Um, and it's really remarkable, the volume and how many people have access to the stock market. And the stock market is simply people who want to buy and then people who want to sell. And there's always a liquid market, meaning that there's always a bid and there's always an offer for almost every single stock out there. And if people are looking to sell, they're going to start hitting the bid, meaning the bid is where people are trying to buy and the stock price is going to go lower. And if people have a big demand, then they're going to start hitting the offer side, which is called the bid and the ask. The ask is the offer side. The bid is the buy side. And that's how the market moves. And historically, the stock market in the United States has gone up. Uh, it's averaged about you know, 9% a year. Uh, but there are some years that stock market goes down, and uh, then there's some years it goes up a lot more than uh, 9%. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a place where people can buy and sell publicly owned shares of stock. Perfect. And I heard you mention the New York Stock Exchange, and that actually gets into our trivia question of the day, Ed. The question is, what year was the New York Stock Exchange founded? I figured you're from New York, so you might have a, a good number. 1893. Actually, you're about 100 years off. Now, I got this from the New York Stock Exchange website. It says the original Buttonwood Agreement was signed on May 17th, 1792. It traces its origins to the Button Agreement because it was signed by 24 brokers in 1792 as a response to the first financial panic in the young nation. So, Wow, I did not know that. I, I know that there was a tree, and that's where they started trading. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I've I've been you know around there quite some time. I did not know it was that early. That's a, that's a remarkable. Yeah, this thing goes way back. That's even to the to the Revolutionary War. Well, let's talk about issues and and you know everyday things that cause the market to move. And and let's start Ed with economic indicators. So let's talk about GDP. Talk to me about unemployment, inflation, various things that we'll always hear about on the news and and how they affect the market. Yeah, and and I'll tell you the trend. Um, is the, the genius of investing is recognizing the direction of trends. And I say this often, I learned it many, many years ago. And a trend doesn't begin at 8.30 in the morning and end at three o'clock in the afternoon, nor does it begin on a Monday and end on a Friday. Um, trends take periods of time uh, to develop. And GDP is the gross domestic product. And that has to, that comes out on a quarterly basis and it dictates how strong the US economy is, but it's also a measure. They also have GDPs of other countries. You know, I always wanna talk about the emerging markets and developed Europe and Japan and China. So you're always looking to see if those economies are growing because oftentimes if those economies are growing, the stock prices are gonna go higher because the growth of companies are doing better. Uh, so the earnings of companies are doing better uh, when you're looking at uh, the GDP number. Um, but there's also unemployment. 
uh, where if uh, if employment is strong, that also bodes really well for corporate earnings. So sometimes you have to look at some of these other major economic uh, factors when you're looking and evaluating stock prices. Absolutely. And then I know inflation is, is a really important topic when it comes to the market. I'd love to hear, because I know this is one of the big things that we talk about. I would love to hear, you know, inflation, interest rates, how that affects the market as well. Well, interest rates have a huge impact on the stock market. So if we have higher interest rates, that is going to eat into corporate profits because a lot of companies borrow money and that's going to require them to pay a lot more in interest than they were previously. Uh, at the same time, it, it also hurts, you know, when you look at the valuation of stocks, if people can get a higher rate at, on a corporate bond than they could previously, then the risk of owning stocks it should be factored in. So people would rather own bonds than own stocks. So that's also another factor. But it's really the inflation is a very misunderstood uh, concept. And most people don't understand that the current inflation rate that the government puts out is really not a, a, a real number. It's a made up number that uh, you know, because there's been so much manipulation. I mean, if anybody believes that their cost of living is only going up 3% a year, um, you know, they're, they're living someplace uh, that, you know, I, I can't imagine where they are living because it's just not true. Um, so, so you have to look at all of these factors when you're looking at the stock prices. But remember, stock prices move six to nine months ahead of earnings and economic data. So that's why oftentimes when a stock will announce really good numbers and they'll come out with really good earnings, the stock price will go down because it's already built into that stock price. And they might say something to the effect of, yes, we had a record quarter, but we don't have good visibility for the next quarter. Well, that means that stock is going to go down because they're not giving good visibility for the future. And that's something that you know a lot of people have to look at. And those are called, uh, you know, those are done on the earnings calls. And one other thing, it's also important to know that there's something called the whisper number. So when earnings are coming out, there's always predictions on what those numbers are going to be by analysts. And when they come out and let's say they're projecting, you know, predicting a 20 cent uh, quarterly earnings uh, number and it comes out at 22 and the stock price goes down, that's because the whisper number where people were really hoping was 27 cents. And again, it sounds kind of funny, but that's how the market works. Mm -hmm. So practically what you're saying in terms of when these companies release earnings or they have these large events, the first thing that comes to mind is Apple, uh, as, at the time of this recording, just held an event last night. And it just so happens that the, the Apple shares are up this week. But what you're saying practically is that doesn't necessarily mean that just because they announce the 97th iPhone, that their shares are all of a sudden going to go up. Right. So, I mean, stock prices go up because of earnings and, and future earnings and where interest rates are. And something else, Jordan, that's important to also remember is the number of people who are involved with the stock market. I mean, you have people all over the world with incredible sums of money that are moving stocks up and down every single day. So it always surprises me when you see on the news when they say, well, stock prices were down because of this reason. Well, how in the world did they do a survey of 100 million people in, in that short a period of time to know why they sold that day? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they always come up with a reason and then the headlines are repeated and they just repeat them and repeat them. And then they become you know, self-fulfilling that everyone says, well, they went down because of this. Mm -hmm. But my goodness, there's people, you know, there's reasons that we sell stocks that have nothing to do with the headlines. Um, not that we're moving the markets, which we'll get to in a little bit about who does move those markets. Um, but it's really amazing how many contradictory uh, reasons there are for people buying and selling every single day. Because for every time you're selling, someone is buying. Um, and it just amazes me on how they try really hard to summarize that everything went up for a reason or went down for a specific reason. Absolutely. And the, before we get into the institutional context, I would want to talk more about market sentiment, as you just mentioned there a little bit. And I want to give you the example uh, of GameStop. I think it was a, a couple of years ago. 
Um, are you familiar with the, the GameStop example? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I figured. So obviously for the listeners that don't know, a bunch of people sort of got together on Reddit and other social media accounts, uh, social media accounts, social media sites, and decided to boost GameStop, uh, the old pump and dump scheme, and then drop the shares once the share prices were very high. Um, so that's kind of a rare case, Ed, but talk to us about market sentiment and its involvement with moving the market. Well, market sentiment, when it comes to GameStop, uh, GameStop is very different than market sentiment when you're looking at the overall market. So when you're looking at a, a company like GameStop uh, or any kind of meme uh, stock that uh, you know trades very little volume, people can get behind those and push those stock prices higher for whatever reason. Um, but that's not normal uh, when it comes to the stock market. Market sentiment, normally when you have very negative sentiment, on the stock market, when you can't give stocks away, the 12 months from that period forward have about, a, on average, a 20% gain. So whenever you can't you know, fat, fathom buying stocks is normally the time where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. And when people are very, very happy about the stock market, it's usually the time for you to be selling because the returns uh, 12 months later are usually negative. So people are doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, usually. Makes sense. Well, let's dive into the institutional level then, Ed, because I kind of use the the GameStop example just to show the the rare occurrence where someone could, you know, boost a, a company's shares and then all of a sudden, you know, leave them. But it still makes a, a move in the market on the short term. But talk to us about the institutional level that's involved in the market. Well, you know, institutions, and these are endowments and uh, foundations, and big pension plans, they're the ones that move the stock market. Uh, about 90% of the volume on the stock market comes from those big institutions. And the majority of those institutions are done through computer trading. So computer program trading is a huge portion of the volume of the stock market. And they follow something called technical analysis. So you have fundamental analysis and technical analysis. And technical analysis is when you see all these charts and these charts say something to a technician and they and they and those technical patterns are put into algorithms, into computers. And when certain things get registered um, on, on that algorithm, then a sell program will kick in or a buy program will kick in and there'll be certain stocks that are bought. So technical analysis really tells you when to buy something. Fundamental analysis tells you what to buy. And fundamental analysis has to do with the balance sheet, uh, the industry, where interest rates are, the earnings of the company. It has to do with the intricacies of the company itself versus technical analysis deals with how it's doing in a chart pattern and they're very, very different animals, but you have to look at both when you're evaluating stocks. You have to know the fundamentals of a company and you have to know the technical uh, entry point or when you're supposed to exit a company. So both are very important. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's a large debate that always goes on between, you know, technical analysts and fundamental analysts. Obviously, for our listeners, you know, Warren Buffett is a name that always comes to mind. He's more of a fundamental guy. He likes to buy companies at a value. And then typically, uh, you know, hedge fund managers and others are more on your technical side because they're trading at a higher frequency than someone like Buffett. Um, but I, I think you're right that that there's kind of a gray area. Oftentimes people want to make it black and white and, and do one or the other, but but both are incredibly important. Yes, without question. And technical analysis is something that very few people have the sophistication to really understand. But again, it has to do with uh, 50 day and 200 day moving averages and where they reach uh, support levels and resistance levels. Support level is if, if a stock had traded at as low as 20, was trading at 22 and then came down to 20. If it broke 20, then they would have broken support and then it could go down to 17 or 16. And all of these people who are technical traders are watching this. And, you know, sometimes they'll exacerbate, you know, a negative move or they'll do it on the high side, like NVIDIA. 
uh, went bonkers because there was a lot of technical buying on that because it broke out of its 200-day moving average. And stocks that make highs make higher highs. Stocks that make lows make lower lows. And that's technical um, chart reading uh, is something very, very difficult to do. Uh, but you need to understand it uh, when you're trying to time what you're going to do in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Well, just to kind of get into the downside of both, Ed. Um, so I know, obviously, when it comes to technical, you just mentioned a few there. Um, I know, obviously, the, thir the first thing I was thinking of when you were talking about following a chart, I'm thinking of day traders. So, you know, I want to talk about the downside of technical, but also fundamental. So what comes to mind there for if a uh, listener's listening right now and they trade on their own, what are the two uh, downfalls to both of these? Well, the, from a technical standpoint, uh, you probably need to, you know, basically you, you, you have to look at the chart pattern and to know when to be buying and when to be selling. And sometimes things will break out of their support level or resistance level and will give you a false reading. Um, and some, you know, sometimes you get stopped out of a stock too early. Like the other day we got stopped out of Pelantir uh, at 17 and a half. And it was a good thing that we did because uh, it's traded down to 14. So that was a good technical play that we got out of that. Uh, on a fundamental standpoint, uh, it, it really has to do with what the earnings expectations are of the company, uh, what kind of employment uh, they're looking at. Are they hiring people? Are they laying people off? Are they cutting costs? And all of those things go into a fundamental analysis. So are there downfalls? Yes, that could be a misreading. You could predict what earnings are going to be and have that number wrong uh, and, and miss that number. So there's always you know, lots of places for people to screw up uh, when they're doing their analysis. And that's what makes the market what it is. Absolutely. Well, let's kind of shift gears into talking about, I mean, I can see over here, we've got CNBC on, you know, Jim Cramer, all of these guys on the news and media. Um, Ed, you've been on. Fox News, uh, CNBC, ESPN, you've been on all these channels, so I'm sure that you may even have some interesting insight on this. Talk to me about where the news comes in, in terms of shifting the market, if it does. Yeah, so I, I don't believe that any of these news channels move the market. I mean, I've been fortunate to be on CNBC and Fox Business and Fox News and you know uh, Bloomberg, uh, and I know that I didn't move any of the markets. Uh, when, when I spoke, but I don't believe that any one person moves a market. Uh, you know, even uh, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, he has the ability uh, to influence the market. Uh, but when it comes to people who normally appear uh, on the screen, they, they don't have any ability to, to really move a market one way or the other, because again, there's so much volume. I mean, we're, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars a day being traded, uh, which is just phenomenal. Uh, you think about, you know, just people in Japan, people in, in you know, Russia, uh, all over Europe, uh, Canada, people are trading every single day. Uh, so I don't believe that anybody on television has the, the ability to, to move a market. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and kind of mentioning, you know, different locations and, and how information travels. I'm actually looking over your left shoulder there at, at Wealth Mismanagement, your book. And I remember there was an excerpt in there talking about, I forget the issue that Chipotle had a couple of years ago, but it was an issue, uh, Seminella outbreak. Is that correct? Uh -huh. You mentioned that in your book and how the information got from, you know, from Europe to America in seconds, whereas in the 70s, 80s, you wouldn't have access to this information. So sometimes you almost wonder if it is a good thing at all. Yeah. So the flow of information, used to happen much slower, but because of communication systems today and computer systems, their information flows very quickly. So the moment something happens anywhere in the world, it can be reflected in the stock price of that company or that industry. So if an airline, for instance, uh, crashed in, you know, call it in France, the, it would immediately be reflected in the shares of stock if the market was open in the United States. And that would happen immediately because as that industry goes, if one stock, uh, you, know, you know, one company gets hurt, all of them get hurt. So you would see uh, Boeing and Airbus and uh, any other plane makers 
they would go down as uh, that company went down because because they're all somewhat related. So so there's there's a, a tendency to um, find one company and it then gets reflected in all the other companies that are in the same industry. So airplanes are one. Uh, you could take cars. You know, if a car got uh, recalled and there was a massive recall for a car, all the other automobile uh, companies would suffer as a result of that. So communication systems have become much more efficient. And again, there's no surprises uh, in the market these days. Absolutely. And I think just getting back to the overall title of this podcast being how the stock market moves, um, one obvious takeaway that a, a two or three year old could give you is that it goes up, right? So I guess <clears throat> just tell us why the market has continually gone up. Do you ever see a scenario where we can't depend on the market providing, I think you said 9% at the beginning. Do you ever see a scenario where we cannot expect as much out of the market if, and we can't necessarily expect it to continue to uh, fund people's retirement and, and things of that nature? Well, look, you, what you have at the core of every company is you have a CEO, a CFO, and other high-level executives whose goal is to create more earnings and earnings are what make stock prices go higher. So if everyone's rowing in the same direction, they're eventually going to see a higher price. So everybody at Amazon at the highest level is working to make that company more efficient and therefore make their earnings look better. And as long as interest rates remain, you know, relatively stable or even lower, that stock price will go higher. Um, so, you know, the idea behind stocks and companies in capitalism is that we're going to continue to see more earnings and that is going to increase stock prices. So over time, you know, as long as people continue with that as an idea, you know, behind, you know, what they're doing at their companies to grow earnings, I don't see any reason why stock prices won't always continue to go higher. But then you have the fear side. And you have people who worry and people who you know want to get out of the market and people who worry that earnings have gotten ahead of themselves and uh, or, or interest rates have gotten ahead of themselves and the price earnings multiples have gotten too high or the earnings yield has, has gotten too uh, high. And as a result of that, you, uh, you really need to, um, you know, overlay on top of the idea that stocks are always going to go higher, you have to look at your own personal situation to know exactly when you need to come out of something and when you need to get more income oriented. And some people just can't handle things going down. Uh, you know, I oftentimes ask people, how much downside can you handle in the next 12 months? Uh, and, you know, when they say uh, a certain percentage, it sounds a lot different than if they had a $2 million account and they say they could handle being down 10%. But then I say, well, could you handle being down 200,000? They go, oh, no, 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 no. And they they kind of have to look at it differently than just a percentage. And they have to look at it from a, the standpoint of how much money they could handle being down. So, you know, I do believe stock prices are going to continue to go higher, but there's going to be times where things are going to get rough. Um, and, you know, we could be entering one of those time periods right now. Absolutely. And yeah, with that, Ed, I will kind of uh, finish this up here. But first, we've got to hit a few questions that we've received. Um, so I thought this question was unique because yesterday at the time of this recording was Halloween. And I had a person ask me about the Halloween effect. So the Halloween effect, uh, or excuse me, the Halloween indicator. And then there's the January effect. And then there's all these uh, you know, theories out there that you should buy or sell at a given time of the year because historical data has shown that months do better. So uh, to tell you the truth, some of these I didn't even know about. I didn't know if this was like a joke that I was being told. Um, but have you ever heard of, of any of these uh, pieces of information? And what's your response to that? Yeah, I, I've never heard of the Halloween effect. I know the January effect. And the January effect is as, uh, as the month of January goes, goes the rest of the year. Um, mm -hmm. and, if, and if stocks do well in the month of January, they should do well the rest of the year. Um, and that's play, you know, played out pretty, pretty accurately. Uh, what is the Halloween effect? The Halloween effect? 
The Halloween indicator, also known as sell in May and go away strategy, suggests that investors should sell their stocks in May and reinvest in November. Okay, so it's saying that I guess the summer months are too volatile. So then you come back after Halloween and then you invest because historically speaking, now is when performance kicks up. But okay, well, I had never heard of that, but I, I know about the uh, the NFL uh, anomaly, uh, anomaly where if you had an original NFL team and it won the Super Bowl, the stock market would do well um, versus an AFL team. Uh, and I don't know how that has played out recently. And then there's the September effect, which is if you invested a dollar September 1st and sold September 30th every single year, your dollar would be worth 12 cents today. Sounds like a, a lot of hocus pocus to me. Yeah, well, I don't think there's any rational reason for it. Okay, Ed, so the other question that I actually had that you mentioned earlier was what is more important, fundamental, technical, or is both involved? Both are very, very uh, important. I would say that fundamental analysis is something that I feel more comfortable analyzing um, and and dealing with and versus technical analysis. Uh, technical analysis I find to be a little 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 hokey pokey, um, and but fundamental analysis I find to be very uh, you know easy to follow and easy to explain. So what you're basically saying is all the technical analysis are starting to invest their money today because the Halloween effect, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think it all goes back to time in the market beats timing the market. So among the whole idea that you can beat the market somehow, beat the S&P by following a chart, is just it's just difficult to really imagine. So I think that's kind of what it all goes back to. Um, but that'll do it for us today, folks. Um, Ed, I will let you take us home. But uh, thank you guys so much for joining episode six. And I will leave it to you, Ed. All right. Well, thanks again for doing this, Jordan. And again, the approach is... Fundamental analysis tells you what to buy. Technical analysis tells you when to buy.